Emate, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Super, super excited uh, to be here. Yeah. Well, you were one of the first people I met at when I moved to Austin mm -hmm. and went to my first health and wellness biohacking conference, which was Paleo FX. Mm -hmm. And I was fascinated by what you're working on and how few others in the space are doing something similar with the same level of ethics. So it's great to have you. Thank you. Um, on one hand, yeah, you know, we think we're doing something special and that no one else is doing. But if, if I'm frank, really every skin care is, is kind of trying to do the same thing, right? Trying to uh, improve skin health, whether they do it only allegedly or, or they're really trying to do it or just to improve the appearance of the skin. That's kind of the premise of the industry. So yeah, we, we are coming from the biohacking perspective of it. I think every skincare company basically is trying to do the same thing, even though they don't communicate it. Hmm. Let's start off today with the unusual or non-negotiables you've done for your health and performance. Non-negotiable is kind of easy because as, as, as they're called, they're non-negotiables, right? So uh, for me, in the last few years, it, it's, it's been uh, sleep as it pertains to performance or to health. Uh, so I'll start my day with at least 30 minutes uh, of, of having my eyes exposed to the sun directly. So not, not through um, a window or anything like that. Try to get some sun on my body as well. Um, less on my face, but more on, on my torso, legs, arms, etc. cetera. Um, second is something called non-sleep deep rest, which I mean, and if anyone can just uh, go to YouTube and see what it is, but it's, it's something like meditation or mindfulness practice integrated through within within the like the middle of the day, more or less. And the third no, non-negotiable is um, bright lights uh, closer to bedtime. So if you can see behind me, I have this uh, red lamp thing. So my house oh. at night turns into a. <laughs> A Star Wars episode, I guess. Like everything is is red. Red. It's actually pretty easy to do right now. Anyone can go to Amazon for a few hundreds of dollars. They can basically equip their apartments in in lights that turn red uh, when it's you know turning seven eight. Um, and maybe the last one is obviously exercise. I am addicted to jujitsu. I do jujitsu every day. Uh, I'm trying to do things around it that supplement that or prevent injury so that, you know, most days that's my second uh, workout of the day. Um, but that is a, that's my religion, right? So <laughs> that's a non-negotiable from, from, a, from a much deeper perspective. Yeah, there's certainly some mindset shifts that come along with martial arts, which yeah. is why I've wanted to get into them for some time. Haven't pulled the trigger and chosen a discipline mm -hmm. the type and style i want to train in but that's on my to-do list but i'm surprised that you mentioned bright lights like mm -hmm. we have red lights throughout our house here as well but are you not worried about the melatonin decrease that occurs with bright lights or red lights or overhead lights because from what i've read each of those can play a role I, I make sure that there are no bright lights. Actually, you, you mentioned a, a, a very good point. So melatonin actually starts, it's the process of producing melatonin starts in the morning. That's why we actually want the bright lights in the morning. And when something very interesting you mentioned is overhead lights. Yeah, you're right. That's why uh, most of the lighting in, that's, that pertains to like sleep habits is, uh, is emanating from the, the lower half of the uh, close to the floor because our eyes are more inclined to take cues from overhead lights uh, as far as wakefulness. So yeah, yeah so I, we, we're in agreement there. Well, that is not the focus of today's episode. Today we'll be talking much more about skin health and beauty and aesthetics. And to start off, why did you choose Young Goose for the name of your company? That's a very random name and it's kind of, that's the quirkiness of it. So first of all, because it's quirky and fun and funny, that's number one before everything. But the story behind the name was for the first five years of us as a company, we actually didn't have a product. We were a research 
organization or research lab that tried to get NAD, uh, which is uh, also called the molecule of life, uh, to get absorbed through the skin and into the body. And unfortunately, we failed uh, because the skin likes it too much, and we made a lemonade out of lemons and made a skincare product. But uh, within those five years, we fell in love with the yeasts that were outside of the lab that we saw every day through the window. And they kind of stopped aging at some point. They just all look the same after like three, four years. They, the, the, the goslings kind of catch up to the mother and they all basically look like uh, uh, the same age more or less. So that, that was a play on that basically on, on having people, you know, look the same age as they, as they grow older and have their kids look exactly like them, et cetera. Well, I like it. What's your background? How did you get involved in this space? So my background is not in, in STEM, in sciences specifically. I was in special operations in the Israeli military, ended up my career as heading the reconnaissance for a special operations unit and got recruited into... Um, biotech or health and wellness tech space, where I ended up after a few roles, uh, we had a very successful, successful company as far as uh, building teams for, for, for tech and, and those type of uh, uh, applications, but ended up uh, heading a company that dealt with pivoting from therapeutic lasers into the red light therapy space. And um, I got very interested in mitochondrial function in in how we keep our our body in a youthful state where it can you know where we can promote health through that and back then you know uh, about 10 years ago that wasn't that popular as much as it is now you know the whole wellness industry was kind of i don't know i re i discovered like leaky gut i don't know 2014 15 and people thought i am out of my mind. So just to give you an idea, it was things that are now seem that seem to be part of the jargon, right? Part of our everyday, everyday uh, conversations were non-existent. So I um, really was obsessed with, with keeping my body as youthful as, as, as I can have it, etc. And I fell in love with NADI. I fell in love with NADIVs. I, I, they helped me tremendously for, for, uh, brain injury I sustained in the military and, and I, my body as a whole. And um, one thing that, that you might know is that they're extremely expensive. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, that's what we tried and, and circumvent that, that modality uh, of, of having it intravenously. Uh, but again, made lemonade out of lemons. Be, and, and, you know, most, not most people, but a lot of people who are undergoing those treatments, want it to be translated to their skin anyway. Uh, having NAD, uh, you know, manifest itself as youthful skin. Um, but unfortunately, even if we do IVs or, or supplements or suppositories or whatever transdermal patches, whatever that may be, our skin is not on the top of the list of priorities as far as what the body thinks NAD should or excess NAD should go to. Um, and the reason is, is because your skin's how how attractive your skin looks isn't uh, isn't very helpful for uh, preservation and survival. Uh, it is in the first you know twenty years. That's why we it's important as far as attraction. But after that, when we've already had our our babies, our body is preserving its NAD reservoirs for other things and. Um, that's why we, we kind of have to have NAD absorbed to the skin directly or, you know, given to the skin directly. Yeah. So I'm imagining that afterward, after you started this company, that you've had a reunion with some of your brothers from the military. How do you convince them that this is something that is of, of importance? Like, why should they pay attention to it? Because I know for a lot of men, myself included, it's kind of like, yeah, I'll get to that at some point. Yes, there's mm -hmm. a correlation between life success and attractiveness and what we all can do to make ourselves more attractive in various different ways. But like what's your go-to for convincing men that this is something they should work on? Depends on the man <laughs> because some of my uh, friends from the military, they want to be rugged, right? They want to be 
scarred and uh, whatever, you know. Uh, so those people I might uh, have a different discussion uh, with as far as uh, them finding a mate and maybe appeasing their wife. But in general, for someone who is more interested in, in longevity, you know, what science is showing us, and that's very prominent in the last few years, is that the skin is not only a mirror of your biological age, it is also driving aging in the body. So it's not only being affected by our body aging, but also the contrary. And the reason is, is because our skin is the barrier for every environmental assault and any, any stressor from the environment that we are exposed to. And what happens is that it starts to develop mistakes, but very, very fundamental mistakes in the way that it functions. Not only things that we can see, but if anyone has ever heard about senescent cells, which senescent cells are, or zombie cells, are cells that the body, they've reached the end of their life. And, for, and through a, a mistake or through a reaction in the body that wasn't dedicated for that specifically, they become a cell that is be between living and dead. It just creates a lot of inflammation. It affects and infects other cells with that inflammation, but it doesn't actually do anything else. It doesn't contribute. And what happens is that when they accumulate, and especially in the skin, it starts creating inflammation that then affects the entire inflammation load in the body. And if anyone knows the, the phrase inflammation, Inflammation is a driver for overall aging, uh, and inflammaging is a big issue with, with, uh, with overall aging. So when you take good care of your skin, especially on the cellular level, on an epigenetic level, you are actually treating a fundamental driver of aging in the body. I recently interviewed Dr. Sandy Kaufman. Yeah. And she was talking about the intricate link between senescent cell burden and aging. And if you're not addressing the senescent cells, how that leads to a decrease in cognitive performance as well as longevity consequences. Yeah. And Sandy is a dear friend. And uh, we've been very fortunate that she recommends us and, and uses our products. And uh, it's, it's a point of pride. Uh, to us. But yeah, uh, obviously, it's one of the nine hallmarks of aging. We like to say that there are 10 because uh, there's one that, that's been, been left out in the seminal paper in, in Cell Magazine 2013, where the nine hallmarks of aging were kind of when th that, that was where, where they were kind of cemented into uh, all of our uh, understanding and, and again, into the fundamentals of, of, of longevity science. And um, we need to understand that even though we have 10 hallmarks of aging, they are not all equal. And as we grow older, senescence, the senescent burden, is one of the major, if not the major driver of uh, exponential aging. Yeah, I didn't think much about the weight of each of the tenants, but that yeah. would make sense that they would be weighted differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and obviously it affects other things. So... Obviously, each tenant affects the other, but senescence, since it creates inflammation, since it creates havoc, it actually affects every other tenant and accelerates them as well. So its effect is unfortunately compounded. I like what you said in the framing of viewing the skin as a biological canary in the coal mine, like mm -hmm. giving you early warning signs that things, certain areas need focus, they might need adjustments and viewing it through that lens as just something that's purely aesthetic. Yeah. Um, first of all, we need to, we need to remember that the skin is going to function perfectly only if every other part of our, of our system is functioning properly and optimally. That's, that's because it's kind of the last in the chain of who gets blood, uh, nutrients, Etc. It's it's a uh, it's very interesting. In their first part of our life, it's more again to, to signal attraction, and on the other other part of our life, it really to signal status. 
because you really need to have you know resources free time to understand how to treat the skin etc that elevates people who have better skin in people's subconscious and people's eyes more than other people and maybe that's the way I'm going to convince someone rugged and um, that doesn't really care about skin at all that they should t- take care of their skin their skin because it's exactly like dressing well exactly like having the car that you think is going to get you I don't know people's admiration um, most of the time what what gets people other people's admiration is the way that they do small things consistently and obviously taking care of their health and, and their skin is is one of those things. Hmm. I heard a fairly shocking stat, and I did not fact check this, mm-hmm. but what it was is that the average American woman spends two hundred to three hundred thousand dollars on topical products throughout their lifetime. And whether or not that's true, you can tell that there's a lot of money going into this, and the, of course, there's going to be different routines that are ideal for each person, the bio individuality component. But if someone was to come to you and say that they wanted help designing the ideal skincare routine, whether that's lifestyle habits, that's products, that's things they should be avoiding, what would you tell them? Well, that's a, that's, that's a lot. So we have a podcast called Biohacking Beauty Podcast, and basically that's what it is. Um, but to answer, I'm going to divide it into a few things. What, what do we do as, as Young Goose, as the company that, that, that I'm the co-founder of, what do we do in order to address that? So first of all, we believe most people should have, or 99% of people should be using our moisturizer that has NAD precursors. And then it dep- individ- individually kind of choose a serum in order to direct the skin to do specific tasks. So again, by individuality, they're more, they need more hydration if they are becoming pigmented, if they, are, if they care about their wrinkles, uh, laxity, whatever that is. So that's kind of the short answer. But kind of zooming out, and, and you asked me about um, how people should structure their life in order to have a, good, a properly functioning skin and optimal skin. Well, we can talk about, first of all, obviously gut health is up there. And the reason is because our gut microbiome also affects our skin microbiome, which is, if you can think, you know, that's a pretty standard example nowadays, but we can imagine anything in our gut is outside of our body and then it gets into the body when the gut kind of lets it in, right? And also our skin is pretty similar. Think of skincare products. They are basically being let in by the skin uh, more or less. So you could think of it as another gut lining, if you would. And, and I know we've already used that example, but um, it also has a, a microbiome and they are getting affected. One gets affected by the other. So first of all, uh, gut microbiome is extremely important. Also, obviously, because it, gut health is in charge of what nutrients we're deriving from our foods, what uh, hormones and vitamins and uh, other essential components we're deriving from our foods. And uh, that is obviously important for skin health. Good sleep, obviously, is extremely important. And that is not only because your body repairs itself while, while you sleep. It's also because as far as our skin is concerned, our skin breathes uh, or intakes oxyg- oxygen more when we sleep, so which allows it to repair itself specifically. So you could imagine why both of those things together are extremely important. Another component that I'd say is also up there as far as uh, your skin is concerned is elimination of damage. So we live obviously in a very uh, artificial society. And when I say by that, what I say by that is that the um, irritants, the damaging things you're being exposed to are a lot of the times things that your body didn't really evolve to even address. So first, obviously, we can talk about the fact that we are not getting out of our house or whatever in the morning around dawn. And the problem is, is that what research is starting to show or, you know, some researchers are researchers are hypothesizing is that early sun exposure actually primes the skin to be able to handle more harmful radiation later on during the day. 
So when we're not doing that and we're just going out for, you know, three hours um, to mow our lawn or whatever, um, at 2, 2 to 4 p.m., the effects of the sun are way more severe. That's number one. Uh, number two, we are obviously uh, living in a very chemical environment. So there are a lot of free radicals that our body didn't really evolve to handle on a regular basis. So everyone knows about uh, oxygen or, or oxygen free radicals, which are called oxidative stress. But there are also uh, carbon and nitrogen free radicals, which are mostly from pollution. And um, again, our body has no idea how to break those down or how to negate those to, for the most part. And uh, they cause a lot of damage. EMF, artificial light, all of those things damage our antioxidative ability in the skin, in our skin barrier, and actually ages our skin barrier, which then ages our skin, which then ages our body. So uh, mitigating a lot of those stressors as much as you can is extremely important. Um, and then obviously we get to tech, like what, what do I like to, to use in order to, to have a healthy skin and a healthy body and, um, what I think other people should use. So obviously red light therapy, I, I come from that field. I'm, I was, uh, heavily invested in the field, uh, and red light therapy is very important. It, it stimulates the mitochondria. It does its skin first. So the benefits that people think they, or the people get for their pains, aches, whatever that is, it goes through the skin first. And for the most part also affects the skin in a very positive way. Uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is very important. If you want to have the skin heal faster from, uh, from some, some injuries some surgery, whatever that is, but also in order to, um, have better stem cell function in the skin, which is another hallmark of aging, and in general have more blood supply to the skin. It's it's very important, you know, not doing it all the time, but doing it once in a while. Exercise, again, we're, we're going to talk a lot about blood and oxygen. Our skin needs oxygen, okay? Like that's uh, a major component of keeping the skin youthful. And exercise not only pumps the blood, delivers the oxygen to tissues, but also our toxin removal system, which is called the lymphatic system, doesn't have a pump like the heart that pumps bl uh, blood around and we can just sit on our couch and blood's going to get everywhere. Our lymphatic system relies on mus muscle movement. And that is why when we're, when we're exercising, when we're moving our body, that uh, detoxification system that the body is, is, is actually um, kind of built around us using our muscles, uh, gets worked and benefits our skin, our every, everything else, but our skin as well. So you're, if you, if you see, there is an overarching component where whatever is good for us, is going to be good for the skin and vice versa, but everything has a component where we can talk about the skin specifically. It's interesting. If we reflect on the things you just mentioned, like early morning, light exposure, movement, sleep, all of these are diet. These are all like pillars of healthy living in general. And they just so happen to also pr profoundly impact skin, mm -hmm. skin health, skin quality. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to, um, I don't know if you know the, the supplement brand Novos, uh, which is mm -hmm. a brand I recommend a lot, not necessarily for the skin specifically, but for overall health, which then affects the skin. And, and I have no financial interest in, in uh, promoting it, by the way. I really like the brand. Uh, but we were talking about uh, how optimal performance, health, and longevity can be completely different things. Uh, but they can also converge. And within that convergence, that's kind of what we want to aim for, that Venn diagram where they all kind of converge in the middle. When we talk about, you know, light exposure... Uh, nutrition, exercise, sleep. Yeah, sleep. We can leave sleep out of it. But three of those four things, we need to make sure that we're doing it in a way where where it converges in the middle. Right? We can have a diet that's very, uh, very effective right now, but is going to actually be uh, detrimental in the long run. The same goes with with light exposure. Obviously, it creates uh, vitamin D, etc. But it can create you know, DNA damage and cancer in the long run. So we can look at each one of those components and make sure that we are doing them in a way that, that 
addresses all those issues. Yeah. I like to think of myself as a bio harmonizer where I work mm -hmm. with the body rather than opposing it. Mm -hmm. And one thing that stood out to me from one of our early conversations was that you're actually not a fan of using skincare beauty products that are solely natural. And yeah. you mentioned to me something that I hadn't considered, and that was what happens when it sits on the shelf. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, so we are in, in in those spaces like we go to the paleo conference and we go to, you know, keto conference and biohacking conferences and longevity conferences. People assume that we are completely uh, clean and there are no no preservatives, no stabilizers in our products, and it's probably just beet juice and some celery extract or something. Um, but actually this is going to be disingenuous. Like if I'm going to make a product that has only completely natural ingredients and has nothing to stabilize the formula, there is nothing to have, uh, the formula be, be at its highest potency by the time it gets to you. you what you're going to basically get is the same thing you would have gotten if you've, if you bought, a you know, a fresh squeezed or uh, extracted juice that sat, sat on the shelf for three to six months. And we know, you know, with juices, it's pretty easy to, to discern because we can see it, right? Uh, we can see how it looks after one hour, let alone three to six months. Um, skincare can be deceiving because the smell, whatever, whatever is there, the consistency can be the same, but, pro the, but the active ingredients within it will degrade. And actually, if you think of it, the word active ingredients kind of alludes to it because active means that they are active. And not only that, it's also reactive. So if we use any type of antioxidant, you are sitting on a time bomb as far as its efficacy, because all it wants to do is attach to oxygen molecules and render them inactive. Okay. So we actually need to go through a few steps in order to ensure the product that you are going to eventually be putting on your skin is the same product we bottled up, is the same product that showed efficacy in a lab when it was, you know, created like a minute before it was, you know, it was used. Um, and those processes, they can be as far as bottles. Our bottles are vacuum sealed, but they also need to be in stabilizers. And I'm not talking about harsh chemicals. The, the science, the, the, uh, the art and science of what we're doing is having things, again, Venn diagram that converges, things that are also healthy for your skin in the short run, also are not endocrine disruptors or also are not yeah. harming longevity in the long run but are also having your skin perform or look the best, you know, when you use them or, or cumulatively. So again, like if you had a completely, completely clean product, you are not getting what you paid for. It can say on the bottle that it is from goji berries, from, I don't know, pecan oil and whatever that is, you're not getting it. It was shipped to you. It was in the USPS truck in the heat. It it's not it's not where you're getting anymore. So it's it's important to understand that. So the problem with these solely natural skincare products is that by the time you receive them, they've broken down, they've oxidized, mm -hmm. and the benefits that are touted on the label no longer apply. And if anything, it could even be worse because you're oh, yeah. receiving oxidized molecules, oxidized product. Not only that, the pH is going to change. So the most important thing as far as skin health is your skin barrier, as far as like long-term longevity and health. Um, and you're, and if you remember like 15, 20 years ago, um, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of products that touted like, oh, we're 5.5 pH or whatever. There was like a fad of it a while back. And it's not completely wrong. It's just that when everyone else did it already, it became redundant and people moved on as far as marketing is concerned. If you don't have a natural neutral pH, you're harming the skin in a way that is extremely cumulative. It's like drinking acid all the time. I don't know. You, we can think of, of many other examples that are probably nicer to hear, but you're accumulating 
ongoing damage, and that can be expressed, you know, in five, 10 years as something like eczema, like uh, skin barrier, other skin barrier fails, uh, rosacea, et cetera. Uh, wrinkles, obviously, dryness, overproduction of oil. It can be expressed in many things. Um, that's number one. But also, like, I hear the sentence, I wouldn't be putting on my skin anything that I wouldn't be eating. So first of all, let's see who's brave enough to just put some a, a bunch of things that, that they're saying that about in, in, their, in their mouth. That's number one. Just you have to, it sat on in the UPS truck for a while. That's, that's number one. Number two, um, I wouldn't be eating anything that can last a year, you know, six months uh, on a shelf. I just wouldn't. Um, so that, to me, is a really flawed paradigm. Yeah, I think the the point of that is to try and avoid some of the endocrine disruptors. Yeah. Although it falls flat when you realize that the product wouldn't last and you wouldn't want to consume it if it did last. Like that. One of the things that we use, for example, in order to stabilize most products, you need some kind of uh, silicone byproduct. Okay, so you can have silicones that are very, very harmful, but you can have a type of silicone that evaporates the moment it uh, gets applied on your skin, like your skin doesn't absorb any of it. Mm -hmm. So we do that, for example, uh, and we have extremely small quantities of uh, like amounts, concentration of it, the lowest concentration possible, but we also make sure that your skin doesn't actually absorb it. Um, in th that's just one example, but definitely like endocrine disruptors, dyes, fragrances, all of the things that can be avoided that are only purely like user experience. We, we are, we're, you know, we don't want to use them or we never use them actually. Yeah. When you mention skin barrier, the first thing that comes to mind for me is probably the most common skincare product. And also now one of the more controversial ones, and that's sunscreen. Mm -hmm. What's your take on that? Well, first of all, I think it's controversial because people believe that now they should have as much sun on their skin as possible. That's a challenge. First of all, because your facial and um, hand and face, like back of your hands and face, uh, normally are exposed to uh, sun, thousands of percentages more of sun than you are in the rest of your body. So as I mentioned before, before we get into uh, sunblock specifically, we can stop and, and think for a second of the fact that our body is, is way more than our face. We can protect our face or our neck, chest, back of our hands and still get a lot of sun. We now, the, the second thing is that we don't really need more than uh, 20, 30 minutes of sun exposure as far as creating vitamin D, even though it is individual. When we do talk about sunscreens, fair disclosure, so we use a natural uh, sunblock that is uh, comprised of zinc oxide. So before I get into that, just the difference between physical or chemical sunblocks or mineral or chemical sunblocks. So chemical sunblocks, what they do is they absorb the, the rays of the sun and they convert them into heat. And if you remember from the last with the discussion we had a second ago, we don't want that heat uh, accumulating within our skin and the the other ingredients that this, that sunblock has, because it actually will change them chemically. An example I think is relevant. If you remember, do you remember um, how a few years ago people were getting uh, really sick because they were vaping? And then people discovered it's the vitamin E in the vape liquid that caused most of the uh, damage. You know, obviously the FDA approved vitamin E to be there. And the problem is, is that they didn't know, they approved just vitamin E in a capsule, but they don't, they don't understand or they don't approve the process of vitamin E then getting converted through heat. And that can happen with many other ingredients that we think of again as natural, etc. Um, and when that sunblock converts the heat, the, the rays of the sun to heat, that is a big issue uh, because it, you're getting different chemical compounds than you've applied on your skin to begin with. That's number one. Number two, the sun is a detoxifier. It, um, it induces detoxification, release of toxins. And when the, you have this chemical sunblock on your skin, 
what's going to happen is that it's basically going to trap those toxins. It be, you can think of like a layer, like a polymer. It builds a type of a sun lens or whatever on your skin. So it traps those toxins on the topmost layers of your skin and actually concentrates them. So whatever you had in many layers or in your body until now is now being concentrated and that can cause trouble. And I foresee that in the future, it's going to be linked to cancer. Um, that's, that's about chemical sunblocks, um, mineral sunblocks or physical sunblocks. They repel those rays. And a lot of people use micronized or nano sized zinc oxide. That's a sham because it gets absorbed into the skin and it doesn't really reflect those rays. So that's just a, bear in mind. So mineral sunblocks do allow the skin to breathe. They only repel the sun. The problem normally is user experience. Again, they create like a white layer on the skin, uh, but new companies, us included, we can avoid that. Uh, last but not least is incorporating antioxidants into the sunblock. So that's something that I haven't heard anyone else talk about until now, but there is substantiated research showing that the better antioxidant ability a sunblock has, the better it is at blocking the damage from UV rays. And the reason is because a lot of the damage from UV rays is creating oxidative stress. So it's a force multiplier. And that is normally where you're going to see the same SPF, you know, um, grade plus the same ingredients, one costing like double more than the other. A lot of the time it's marketing, but sometimes it's because of the other ingredients that are there. I see. So yeah, the, the quality of the sunscreen makes a huge difference and it, you might be doing more harm than good when you get something cheap, that's a chemical based. And mm -hmm. a lot of these ingredients haven't been studied when they're actually exposed to light, strangely yeah. enough. They've been studied in a lab, but not in a real world setting not in combination with the other ingredients in the yeah. products. So for me, if I don't have access to a high quality sunscreen, I won't use it. I'll wear a hat and instead yeah. I will eat my chaga mushrooms. I will take mm -hmm. astaxanthin, which mm -hmm. is like a form of like internal sunscreen almost. Yeah. I will take and use a peptide called melanotan sometimes mm -hmm. to further increase the melanin levels in my skin so mm -hmm. that I can resist some of the uv rays without amassing some of the same uv damage i'd otherwise get from the absence of all that yeah melanotan is also called the hollywood peptide because it does also increase um you know muscle mass etc and who wants to be more tan and have more muscles <laughs> uh it's movie stars um yeah. astaxanthin is it's like a three to four spf as far as like the uh, grade that it can give you if you if you supplement on it Another thing that I'm, I'll mention is um, obviously America and labeling in the United States, I can call mineral sunblock, mineral sunblock, or a sunblock, mineral sunblock, even if it has only a partial of its uh, sunblock makeup as mineral. So let's say it's 5% mineral and 95% chemical, I can call it mineral sun, sunscreen. So the only two um, mineral sunblock agents that you should be seeing on the back of the package when you flip it over are zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. The other one are going to be chemical. And I can, the, what, what we can say is that you will always find the active ingredients when you flip the box because sunblock is a drug technically. It has a it's classified as a drug by the FDA. So they have to disclose what's there. What are the active ingredients there that are classified as a drug? Yeah. And with those two, the titanium dioxide and the zinc oxide, I know that I've used them many times and a lot of times they have a really ghostly like white color. <laughs> and then I also came across a study maybe a year ago that was showing that one of them, it's not the panacea, it seems like. Have you come across that? Uh, yeah, so we were trying to do a titanium dioxide drops um, that you could just add to anything that you wanted, basically make it a sunblock. The problem is, is that that can accumulate in the skin that can be um, comedogenic. So that can kind of block pores and that can lead to other things. 
that's that's as far as like a titanium dioxide. So it's not necessarily like harm uh, on a, like a cellular level. It can definitely be an irritant. It's not, you know, it's not for most people, it, they would find that accumulation of it is not something that they want. As far as zinc oxide, it's completely safe, especially if it's non, non-nano sized version, but there is the problem of a white cast. So again, what we do, and it took us like four years to develop, we match it with iron oxides. It has this pinkish color. It's not makeup, but it makes it so anyone that applies it, if they are uh, African-American, um, if they have, um, you know, whatever, opaque skin, whatever, whatever, whatever skin they have, they're not going to have this uh, white cast. Hmm. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, information depicted in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.